kind of definition of a startup would be there's a company that doesn't work, <laughs> you know, because you, know, you know nothing works because right. you're building it, and sometimes you're a company that doesn't work in an industry that doesn't exist, and so the you know the borderline between like genius and crazy here is not <laughs> really not that big, um, and, and you know the ones that are geniuses that you know are ones that you know can go into this create a new category and build a company there. This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf, and Joe Fit. Hey. Yo. What up? Hi there, homie boy. Woo, man. This is a good one. That was. I yep. thoroughly enjoyed this episode. Yes, as will this listener. Yes, I'm talking to you, Mark. You're going to enjoy this one. And Harry. Harry. Yep. Harry's tuning in. Harry, like my arm. Yeah. <laughs> it's true <laughs> i got that idea <laughs> all right jill. jill jill you're representing the women yeah out there jill and mark you're gonna love this one <laughs> stick <you> around <laughs> why not harry um yeah, this one's not for harry it's not harry one. if you're listening tune up all right all right all right uh well well this one's this one's a, a actually a kind of a long awaited one this is a guy that we were introduced to six seven months ago or so mm -hmm. our buddy chris kremitzos from podfest yep i gotta give a little shout out to our boy yep um but boy. yeah this is <laughs> this is nigel eccles is who we have on the podcast today yeah and um his current title is the founder or or you know, co-founder of Flick, and it's a uh, flickapp.com. Mm -hmm. But uh, and you might not know about that quite yet, but possibly very soon, mm -hmm. hopefully. But the the company that you probably do know him from is FanDuel. Yeah, he was the co-founder and CEO of Fa FanDuel for what? What do you say? Ten years? Uh, at least, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it was at least ten years. Yeah, pretty freaking awesome because we get the full backstory of that yeah he was basically involved with writing the laws <laughs> around this this type of app in the united states betting like, and all that yeah, stuff. The, yeah the, fantasy. The, the fantasy sports betting and stuff like that he actually worked with legislators and created the laws alongside with them to, to get this <laughs> stuff in the united states <laughs> can't even imagine like it's that's just so foreign you know and yeah and so it's really cool to hear his perspective he, he broke down how at the end of the day you know dealing with law yeah it's difficult but they're not as bad as they actually uh might seem yeah you know <laughs> so he gives the story there i thought that was pretty fascinating yeah so you're, you're gonna hear the whole origin story of FanDuel, which i believe is a, a billion dollar company right not sure i'm not that, sure okay but, I, I don't quote me but yeah. I, I'm, I i thought it was like in that range it could be i mean it's huge and and you know obviously they've been on uh you know tv for a very long time and and so it's really interesting because he breaks down not only how they started as a startup how they morphed and pivoted throughout the years but also how they marketed and uh, i thought nigel actually gave a really interesting perspective on marketing how there's a there's kind of a widespread approach and then there's a smaller pr uh, you know approach and his perspective and experience around that mm -hmm. i thought it was pretty cool because i'm like huh because it's something obviously we're not all we don't all have the budget to go on tv yeah <laughs> with our ads but you know you can kind of take his his uh model more or less of how they did their marketing for fanduel mm -hmm. and apply it just maybe it's on a more micro scale yeah that's yeah. cool yeah, I mean, it definitely some some good ideas around how FanDuel grew and became such a monstrous company. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at the end of the day, both are required the, the sort of wide and the, the sort of sniper approach, right? right. Um, yeah. they're, they're they're both kind of necessary. But that's not all we talked about either. We actually talked about his new app, the Flick app, and uh, and, and how to build communities around things like podcasts and Instagram accounts and the influencers, uh, influencers, and, sport, and yeah. things like that. We talked about venture capital and how to raise venture capital for businesses. Uh, I mean, we covered a lot of ground we in did. this one. Yeah, no, we actually covered quite a bit. And Nigel is super gracious with just sharing pretty much everything. Yeah, he's he an open asked, book, he for a, sure. Yeah, so awesome, dude. You're going to love this interview. And um, and he also recommended some pretty damn kick-ass books. Some of them we heard of before, but... Um, you know, it's very startup angly sounding, but a lot, I mean, all that stuff applies to any business. Yeah. I mean, yeah. small businesses can They're look at what massive startups are doing. Yeah. And well, that's kind of an oxymoron, isn't right, it? Massive right. startup. But uh, <laughs> yeah, look at what some of these big sort of unicorn kind of companies are doing and still draw ideas from them and still implement some of the things that you're learning from these 
other companies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot to take away for anybody. Where, how to how to sort of exponentially grow a company? How to um, how to build a community around what you're doing? How to raise venture capital? I mean, it, raising venture capital is still selling yourself, still selling the business. Even if you're not trying to raise venture capitalists, there's venture capital. There's still ways to leverage this information in your business somehow. Yeah. And how to validate ideas, Mm -hmm. how to validate, how to uh, scale things. I mean, there's, I felt like this was actually a really good masterclass at taking an idea, a concept Mm -hmm. and making it a reality. And in his case, you know, growing this company to some large number that yeah. literally is a household name that everyone knows what FanDuel is, or at least have heard of it. I could have sworn I had it on my notes, but now I'm not finding it. Well, like, you can search for it, but I think it's time for notes. Notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I, actually, it was kind of cool because when Nigel was talking about business models, we were talking about information being free and some being paid and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we we told him our business model, and he kind of validated that. Yay! Yeah. Uh, but he basically said, "Yeah, the 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 model that we have, which are these notes that I'm about to tell you about, is you know every single podcast we have a note taker, mm. and those notes are free for two weeks." So this episode has notes from what everything everything Nigel said here and us, and then those are free for two weeks. And then after two weeks, you got to pay fifteen dollars a month. And but the thing is, you're not necessarily buying just more information. Mm-hmm. I think that's the key thing. It's no, you're actually getting uh, a time savings. You mm-hmm. don't. You're not listening to two episodes. You know, a, a week, mm-hmm. an hour each on average. And or if also, you are, you don't have to sit there and take the notes on them while you do. There you go. So that's the flip side. You know, mm-hmm. we did the work for you, but you also get access to bonus material from our guests, from us in video format and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and and all of these different resources behind the the fifteen dollar wall or the yeah. epic vault. But yeah. but for day, why don't you just go get these notes for just free? get the notes. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting. It's yeah, like yeah. a business model and he was like, Yeah, that's that's pretty much that's it, it works and it's, it, it's great. It's true. And it, there's value in all ends is kind of the whole point of it all too. Yeah. So, get the sure. notes. So get if you want to get the notes, they can do that. You can do that. They can do that. They, you, any of us, we all can really. We all can. You go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp yeah. or it was a high high pitch comp slash comp or that's when you know Matt's serious. Text three eight four seven zero and text the word comp. Comp. That's our new jingle. It's a kazoo jingle. That's the kazoo jingle. We hired a really expensive uh, musician to to compose that jingle for us. Yeah, the musician doesn't know it yet, but uh, his check's gonna bounce. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not cool. To the musician. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do the most annoying sound. No, I'm not. Let's not. Let's not. <laughs> Some not people might be it. listening in I, headphones. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. All right. Let's cut to it. Get the notes. Hustleandflowchart.com slash comp or text 38470 in the word comp. You'll get the notes for free. Be quick. Only two weeks. Hey, before we jump over and chat with Nigel, I wanted to take a real quick minute and tell you about LinkedIn. LinkedIn helps you reach the right professionals at the right time, and people are kind of kicking butt with LinkedIn ads at the moment. It's got over 62 million decision makers hanging out on LinkedIn, so you can kind of get in front of anybody on LinkedIn. That's what's pretty cool about it is almost anybody you can think of is on LinkedIn and you have the ability to get in front of them. And with LinkedIn ads, it's not just about awareness. You can actually drive traffic. You can drive engagement. If you've got landing pages, webinars, podcasts, uh, sales pages, opt-in pages, you name it, you can drive traffic to it using LinkedIn ads. So check it out. LinkedIn is hooking up Hustle and Flowchart listeners with a hundred dollar ad credit. Super, super cool, super generous of them. So go try LinkedIn ads for your yourself with this hundred dollar LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign. All you got to do is visit linkedin.com slash flowchart. That's linkedin.com slash flowchart. Terms and conditions do apply, but go try some free LinkedIn ad credits and test out their platform. I really think you're going to dig it. Hey, Nigel, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. No, thanks for taking the time. And I know you're you're busy in startup mode yeah. with uh, your your Flick app, and mm-hmm. you're just uh, startups. I'm sure are a grind. We've been in a few of them, but 
I know yours is taken to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we've no, no startups are like a straight line, but uh, I think we maybe weave more than most, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a special beast that you have to kind of wrangle. <laughs> but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as you start getting other people's money involved, other people want to have more voices. And uh, this is our my own sort of negative experience yeah. with startups. Is <laughs> the more money you get involved in the startup, the more these people that give you the money want their voice uh, heard. And yeah, that definitely is is a big part of it. I think the other thing is that you know, and I uh, as a kind of late into being a startup, I didn't fully appreciate is that um, a start is kind of definition of a startup would be there's a company that doesn't work, <laughs> you know, because, you know, because, you know, nothing works because right. you're building it. And sometimes you're a company that doesn't work in an industry that doesn't exist. And so the, you know, the borderline between like genius and crazy here is not <laughs> really not that big. Um, and, and, you know, the ones that are geniuses that, you know, are ones that, you know, can go into this, create a new category and build a company there. Um, but, and it's, it's hair raising because in any kind of small deviations up or down, whenever you extrapolate it, they, you know, for example, if, if my metrics at Flick, they're going up three days in a row and I draw a line, I can say, you know what, we're going to be billionaires within two years. <laughs> right. But if there's three days in a row that they're going down, I'm like, we're going to be zero in like three months. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and just through normal variations, there's days where, you know, we think the former and there's, you know, two days later, we're thinking the latter. So <laughs> that's, that can, you know, that can definitely play with the mind. It's kind of the plight of the uh, entrepreneur. You know, that's what we all signed up for. Is this <laughs> roller coaster in life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have a let's let's get into your backstory and what led you mm -hmm. up to this point because I know it's fascinating. And you know, you ran a company, sure. started a company that I'm sure most people have heard of. Mm -hmm. So take us back to what got you in entrepreneurship and and kind yeah, of all that. So I uh, joined my first startup actually back in 2000, uh, which was a, a company called Flutter.com, which uh, was a betting exchange in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. I was there for a couple of years. Uh, we then merged with Betfair, uh, which was another betting exchange. Um, and sort of th that sort of experience really was really valuable to me that that's, I knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted to go and start my own company. Um, it, it took me a few more years to get the courage to go and do it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't until 2007 that we started uh, the company that we'd become FanDuel. Mm -hmm. um, but it really was built on that experience. I loved, um, like I loved the experience of like building a product. I loved the experience of like building a team. Um, and you know, getting feedback from customers, and then changing the product, and uh, just that the you know the excitement, the dynamism of being in a, in a startup. And so, uh, in two thousand seven, uh, myself and four other co-founders started a company, which then was called Hubdub, hmm. uh, which was a prediction market. And then uh, two years later, uh, we pivoted and became Fanduel, um, mm -hmm. and then grew, grew Fanduel from there. So it's interesting. So you started off as a, a prediction, and that's in the in the betting space still. Well, yeah. So it was a play money prediction market. We actually did a lot in politics. So huh. this was two thousand eight, um, the two thousand eight election, which is when Obama was elected the first right. time. And so we had actually very very active politics markets, and we also had active sports. Um, and people were trading predictions on who would win which state, who would win the election, um, and but it was for play money. People would accumulate the play money, and the idea was it would be a sort of ad-supported model. Um, mm. And the problem that we ran into was the business model just wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. um, people loved the product. Um, they, uh, I still have people sometimes mention it to me and say, oh, yeah, I love playing at HubDub. It was so much fun. <laughs> um, but we realized we need something that, Bet, you know, just monetize better. And so we looked at it and we said, you know, we've got a good team here. We're good at building a really engaging game. Uh, sports is a category where it's always throwing up content. And even though we hadn't focused on it that much, that had become our biggest category. 
And we also saw that fantasy sports was a place where we could have a, a, a legal prediction game for real money. And that's when we sort of said, okay, well, maybe we should take this hub dub idea and we should move into sports and but do something in fantasy sports, but make it sort of, um, you know, faster and more exciting. Yeah, I'm interested in what, uh, what was it that allowed you to see that the business model originally at uh, HubDub that caused you to do the pivot? Was it a financial thing? Was it projections? Yeah, or? it was because like our user numbers were growing linearly mm-hmm. and uh, and I could draw a line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that line did not equate to a large number of users. Um, yeah. And then I also could figure out, well, how much are we making per user in advertising? And you, you, know, you draw that line, you multiply that small number by a very small number, and, and you suddenly realize that like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to run out of money long before we're going to become an interesting business. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. You notice that. Yeah, it's not exponential. If it's linear with small numbers yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially with an ad-supported model where it, exactly. you need volume. You, right. know? You, need, you, know, you need to get you know, really exponential growth. Mm. Um, and so we, uh, that was at the start of 2009, said, ooh, we need to get out of this ad business and we need to get into a, into some sort of transactional business. Mm. Now, did you run into any sort of legal barriers when you were setting up FanDuel just because of uh, the- not, not in the early stages. So fantasy sports has been around for over 50, no, actually since it's about 60 years. Um, wow. And it, it, uh, it's considered a game of skill in, in pretty much every state that people play it in. Um, and so we certainly went to our lawyers and said, look, we want, we want to get your blessing on this. Um, and they said, sure, you know, fantasy sports, like mm-hmm. it's kind of commonly accepted uh, that it's a game of skill and it's legal. Um, and so we, you know, we took their advice on how we set up the games and, you know, things to avoid. Uh, and then we, you know, that was fairly straightforward. And so, no, certainly we didn't have any issues for the first, you know, sort of, I'd say three or four years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Until you got big enough to Until you were looking at it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but that's when you know you're like, oh, okay, we're on to something. Now people yeah. are yeah. so the, the, the legal after. issues that you did run into, was it basically because because of the visibility, because it, it grew and you were just on more radars? Yeah. No, I think that's right. So you know, when you're small, no one cares. Um and uh like and no one really yeah, no one really wanted to care and no one cared. And then when we became big, um, we, you know, we, we suddenly, and we, we definitely made enemies, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, a sort of state attorney general level. And, hmm. um, and I think, you know, there, there was two things. We, we definitely made enemies, but I think there was also another thing which um, legislators, and we actually agreed with them. They said, wow, you know, okay, we're fine with this being a game of skill, but it, it feels crazy that there is no consumer protection here. There's no guidelines. There's no, there's no guardrails in this industry. You know, you guys are handling billions of dollars and, you know, there's no one regulating you. And we said, yeah, you're right. There should be. In fact, we, even before some of the regulatory issues, like about a year before I drafted up like self-regulation, um, rules and in fact when we went to um write when we went to work with legislators to write laws for the industry mm-hmm. you know some of the things we picked up were the self-regulation that we had written many years before so so it, it it was something that we actually as a company sort of agreed with and said yeah like there is room for a sense of regulation here and let's work with you on it um it was a messy and incredibly painful process but <laughs> like, i think I the bet. outcome was, was a good one that's interesting to be in that position to write laws. I mean, that's yeah. that's you're doing something. I would say you're doing something right because you're creating. You're in a completely new space and yeah. it's yeah. a different paradigm you're shaping. Yeah, yeah. Then that like that was definitely a real eye opener to me. Like I, I guess I maybe had a. I actually came out of the experience of like uh, this surprised everyone because of better. Uh, opinion of government <laughs> yeah um, like I always sort of thought they were all kind of nakedly self-interested and um, you know maybe somewhat corrupt and you know my experience actually working with legislators is they were by the large part public servants who genuinely wanted to 
do good things and kind of leave the world a slightly better place. Um, good. And good so, to hear. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. It was a, a you know, it was a real surprise. And and we worked in states like you know Illinois and, and New mm -hmm. York that you know, don't have the best reputation at times. Right. And, with business but what and all we that. Find yeah. was that you know they. And, 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 you know, I think it was good in that the industry was like, look, we're supportive of regulation. You know, we don't love taxation, but we accept that you're going to tax us. Um, and uh, we, we we're willing to work with you that, you know, regulation that kind of protects the industry, protects consumers. Um, let's try and find a middle ground that, that works for all of us. Yeah. Now, the, the company, it, it started in Scotland, correct? That's right. Yeah. So in, in Scotland, how how different are the rules and the, the laws in Scotland versus the U.S.? Where did did some of the legislation stuff come up when you were trying mm -hmm. to expand out into the U.S. or did you deal with this in Scotland as well? No. So we while the company started in Scotland, we only ever operated in the early years in the U.S. Oh, um, gotcha. Okay. So we never really had sort of legislative issues there. Like the British the British system of dealing with this stuff is very different. Um, so the uh, the British system, I would say, is uh, you have a sort of a government body. So like you grow, you get to a certain scale, you engage with some particular government body, and you kind of work out some rules that kind of work. And um, and if things go wrong, there's people you can kind of go and talk to, and generally things are kind of worked through. Mm -hmm. um, the American system is is much more sort of adversarial, <laughs> where you know, like you go from like there's no one you can talk to because there's like you know the government doesn't have a you know a, a department for this, um, so you just have to kind of go and do stuff that you think well okay this this seems fine the laws are fine, until the day that someone in government suddenly dislikes it and yeah. then you know threat threatens you with the nuclear button. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's like uh, one it's like either nothing or you you're yeah too exactly <laughs> exactly it's like you go from like zero to like you know you go from hero to zero yeah. uh, and then and then there's a huge fight um and then there's lots of headlines and hmm. uh and you know there's threats sort of going back and forth and then and then if it finally everybody gets in the room and they kind of settle it out and then you don't hear of it again um <laughs> so it's it's kind of it's quite different um and yeah. that, that kind of you know, certainly sort of surprised me um, how differently things were kind of done. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you think that uh, the the fact that you worked with government at that level uh, helped you really grow and make more of a like a household name for FanDuel? Because I know um, obviously there's yeah, other. I think it was. I think it was very good for the company in that, uh, like, it showed us. Um, it showed us as being kind of responsible actors. Um, like I love to tell the story, like in 2016, when we passed the law legalizing fantasy sports and or clarifying the law and legalizing fantasy sports in New York, um, in that same session, both Uber and Airbnb both uh, lost their legislation. They both mm. failed to pass it. And, and I think a lot of it was just kind of the approach we took to it, which was kind of like, look, let's let's treat legislators with respect. Let's mm -hmm. kind of all be grown ups about this, um, and then and also let's listen to their concerns on you know things like consumer protection. So I, I think that was very good for the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it kind of sounds like that the rideshare companies sort of came into it with an us versus them approach, and totally and you kind of yeah, came totally. into it with let's trample all over their rules. Because you know we're, we we will tough it out, and as they are finding now, you know, the government maybe a little bit, of, you know, may have they may have pushed them won a few battles, but in the long run, government kind of tends to win. Oh yeah, yeah. they yeah. kind of have a little bit more power than all of us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm curious how how did FanDuel grow? I mean, what what were some of the mm -hmm. things that really gave it some traction? Sure. So like the first thing and should never be overlooked is we had a product that users loved. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, before FanDuel, you know, fantasy sports was involved you going and finding, you know, 10 or 11 friends, you know, getting into a room, organizing a four hour draft um, uh, and, and, you know, and then playing that game over a period of four months and then maybe getting paid if your commissioner mm -hmm. Kind of has managed to collect all the money, uh, you know, at the end of the season. So, like, tremendously fun game, and like, 
a lot of people would say those aren't those aren't bugs; those are features. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but and what we said was, well, that's cool. That's a fun game. But what if we took that game and we made it faster? We're gonna we're gonna have the game last a day, and we're gonna say you don't have to go and find a bunch of friends. You can actually play with anyone. And actually, instead of just playing in a ten-person league, you know, paying ten dollars to win maybe a hundred dollars, why don't you play in like a you know, a hundred thousand person league and you can pay $10 and you can win a uh, million dollars. Right. And so that was our, uh, and then thirdly, at the time, um, the products weren't really mobile optimized. Um, and we said, well, why can't you just do this whole thing on your phone? I can go in, pick my players, submit, and then within like three minutes be watching the games. Like mm. surely that'd be a lot more fun. Yeah. So that was the first part. Have a product that users love that's incredibly fun. And then the second part was uh, when we got to that, we were like, okay, how do we you know, drive awareness to this? And there, honestly, it was, it was really just very disciplined marketing um, uh, of growing the category. And you will see in all of Fangio ads at the time, mm-hmm. we put our product in the ads. We always put it front and center. We always really explain the benefit. And so over that period from 2009 to 2015, the company was growing sort of between three and five X year, every year. Wow. Um, and that was, you know, baseline of a product people loved, but then really driven by marketing that really kind of knew who the target consumer was and, and kind of talked to them and, and, you know, explained the product to them. So in the marketing side of things, I know obviously you have, you're on TV and I mean, mm-hmm. you're on all sorts of things. What was the most effective channel that you can identify? Yeah, so, um, well, there's, there's kind of two things. There's, there's, in marketing, you tend to have efficiency and you have reach. So efficiency is like what's your lowest customer, customer acquisition channel? And then reach is like where do you reach the most users? Um, mm-hmm. uh, TV is nearly always the one that has the most reach. Um, uh, and then the ones that are the most efficient usually have the least reach. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, like for a classic example, um, historically, um, uh, cost per click uh, on Google, if somebody's searching for fantasy sports, that's great. Like that is a, uh, that's a very high value, very targeted um, consumer. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately for us is that you know, people who might be searching for fantasy football in September, but no one's looking for it in like October, November. Mm-hmm. And with our product, you could you could play at any time of the year. Um, and so what we needed to do was uh, uh, we needed to create demand and create awareness. You could start playing fantasy football at any point in the season. And so for that, we had to go beyond digital and go into initially into radio and then into television. Um, mm. So that people, like when we did digital ads in October, People just wouldn't even see them. They'd be like, "Oh, that must like that must be a mistake." Because <laughs> everyone knows that you can't start playing a fantasy football in October, but you put it on radio and TV, then you have an opportunity to like really tell the story. And then particularly effective uh, is host endorsed ads. So when you get the host mm. saying, "Hey, come join me in in my fantasy football league. We're playing this Sunday," then that was very very effective. Yeah, and I could see the broad messaging like on. TV or on radio, what you're mm-hmm. doing is you're almost like establishing this new idea in people's minds of what's possible before that's it's right. like a paradigm shift. And then once that's happening, then you're kind of, it seems like you're moving them online so you can mm-hmm. clean up with the ads and other marketing. Yeah. So what broadcast media is, is, is really good at is, um, is, is creating a demand, creating a story. Um, uh, digital media is great at capturing it. Um, so once someone is, has a sort of general awareness, then they come online and then they then then they're much more likely to click on an ad or actually search for the product. Mm. Uh, but but broadcast media is just sort of great at sort of saying, hey, there's this new thing you've never heard of before, and there's new thing you can't you never knew you could do before. Um, yeah. And that's how we kind of balance the two media types. Yeah, I'm curious how how do people play fantasy football during the off season? How does that even work? <laughs> during the off, well, no. So you could you could play in October. So traditional fantasy football, you would have to start before the start of the season. 
So you oh, say mid season, basically. You can oh, start at any point in the season, all the way up to the Super Bowl. Oh, got you, got you. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see. Then, you know, oh, okay, okay. Then, yeah, my my my. Uh, I'm thinking October's off. Season. October's middle of season. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got the you know we've got the XFL now, so that's right. Uh, a little bit of off season play. I saw yeah. that. Yeah. It Hopefully, just started it doesn't go the, the same way as the AFL. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. The this XFL is, uh, first weekend looked good. You know. So let's see. Let's it see. It did. Yeah, I saw a couple games. Everyone's kind of surprised, but no, let's see. We'll see. So uh, with FanDuel, I know you exited that company. Mm-hmm. Um, did, how did that, like, was there a reason why you exited or we just... Yeah, so I left uh, about six months before the company sold. Uh, like, I'd been there 10 years. Mm. Like, um, you know, when anybody leaves, there's, also, there's never really one reason. Yeah. Um, I, you know, some of the things for me were... Uh, I had already sort of planned to leave as part of a merger uh, and then that merger got blocked. So we were going to merge with DraftKings. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, to some extent mentally, I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm leaving. I had to sort of, I sort of went to look at sort of new things that I was going to plan to do. And then, um, and then what happened was it got blocked. So I'm back at the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing was like during that period, I started to sort of think about what are the things I love doing and, I really loved early stage and, and building something new. Yeah. And so, uh, and actually Flick was something that I'd been thinking about for some time. And so there's never a really good time. Also when the right. company was in, in, you know, lining up to be sold, I had to sort of think, well, do I want to go and work at like an early, you know, start again and start an early stage company or do I want to go and work in like a really big corporate event company? And that to me is usually always a fairly easy decision. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that makes sense because it's almost like a point where it's like, okay, well, I've, I've done what you could, you know, you've done what you could there. Yeah. And it seems like, I mean, you've definitely, you've learned a lot through the startup and, and through the growing of that company, which a lot of startups fail anyway. So, um, yeah. So that, so Flick, it sounds like started almost pretty closely after you left then huh oh yeah it was straight after yeah like yeah. i left i left with one of my uh co-founders of fanduel and we immediately went into uh to starting our uh our, our next company so yeah. where, where did the idea for flick come from how did how did you guys start that one up yeah so it, it goes back actually it was one of the things that we had on fanduel um we had a thing called fanduel chat um mm-hmm. which was incredibly fun it was basically anybody who was on the site could chat with any of the other members um it was total nightmare to manage uh, <laughs> because this was like a free for all but it was so much fun and when we started to really scale like it um uh it, we struggled to scale it and we had to we were starting to spend so much time and in, in building it and fixing it and dealing with the moderation issues that it was taking away from our focus on building the, the sort of the core platform, the right. fantasy platform. So we had to drop it. And I always sort of thought that was a little bit of a mistake. Um, and so when I left FanDuel, I was like, wow, it, it really shouldn't have to be in a decision. Like there should be this product out here where people can, you know, have la- live conversations about, you know, things they're passionate about. So, um, and, and that was really the idea is like, you know, whenever a game is on, I want to go and hang with other people who are watching that game. And, yeah. and you can kind of do it on Twitter, but it's not great for conversation. You can kind of do it on Reddit. And so we wanted to be that unique place uh, where you could hang and have that conversation. Nice. Yeah. So Flick, I know it caters to uh, the podcast community, but uh, it, does it sound like it can it work outside of just podcasts as well? Because you said, you know, like oh yeah, absolutely. Time. So okay. yeah, so podcasts is is a big area for us. Um, but uh, sports and sports podcasts are, are are particularly strong. So like sports mm-hmm. in the last, I would say, four or five months have gone from maybe being thirty percent to probably over ninety five percent. And <laughs> what we found was that they were using it and they were using it for their podcast. But what they really were excited about was using it for whenever, you know, they'll be like a Lakers group. And whenever the Lakers go live, they'll want to bring all of their fans to the, that group to chat about the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because, I mean, we like we have a Facebook group, for instance. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people use Facebook for their groups. And it's probably because mm-hmm. it's 
you know, just something inside a platform that they're used to using. Have yeah. You, um, what's your perspective on like that? Because obviously there's communities all over the web. Uh, yeah. So like what we find there with what we find and we, we survey our users regularly and say, well, where else do you do this? Um, they're actually for conversation and particularly live conversation, there really isn't anything. So mm -hmm. Facebook is really good for sharing media and commenting on it. Um, but it, it doesn't, it's not really a conversational platform. It's kind of like you post, then maybe somebody else will post like five or 10 minutes later. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work well on around live events. And, and that's where we've tr tried to really focus on being really, really good. Got it. Yeah, so that makes sense. So it's more of a real time thing. There's a yeah. larger audience. There's a collective community that wants to just share thoughts and passions and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, gotcha. Now it's interesting. So, what similarities have you found from you know, like your FanDuel days and startup and growing in Flick? Now, obviously, you have the chat mechanism or the community mechanism similar, or at least the concept. Um, have you drawn any? kind of comparisons and ways that you've been able to do things well in Flick or maybe even uh, some with, mistakes. With their experience at, at Fangio, you mean? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of your prior experiences mm -hmm. and what you're doing now. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sort of what sort of information and, and what sort of knowledge did you bring over to Flick yeah. that you've leveraged in or from FanDuel to Flick? <laughs> yeah. It's a very different product. Uh, in fact, that was one of the things that kind of excited me about it you know, the opportunity to learn something new. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, FanDuel was really a gaming product. It was a paid acquisition um, product where, you know, we, we paid to acquire users and we delivered a, a paid gaming experience. Um, and that that's become a category that I, I feel I know pretty well. Um, and so I was quite excited to do something that was more in a like a social media category, much more like Twitter or, or you know Instagram or, or Snapchat, uh, which is a category I don't really know that well. Mm -hmm. So it's um, th that was kind of what excited me. Like it's also what makes it kind of a lot more challenging, which is we're doing something totally new and, in this new category. Yeah. It Go ahead, oh, I was going to say. So why um, why did you make the decision to focus on podcasters? Um. Why do we? I think we felt what podcasters was that they had they podcasters would love to talk about their community, but mm -hmm. they're not really a community. <laughs> like because yeah. community me means that the people that are in it have like can have interactions with each other and they can also have interactions with the host. Um, and we thought it was really interesting that podcasters thought of their listeners as a community, but there wasn't really a good platform for them to engage with their community or their community to engage with each other. And so we sort of thought, well, clearly this is a, this is a you know, vertical where they, um, you know, where, where they kind of need this solution. And so that's why we sort of focused on that last year. Hmm. I could see that because I mean, even, you know, talk shows on radio are like that too. And, mm. and uh, you mentioned yeah. even reality TV shows, there's, yeah. there's a lot of different, um, well, I guess they're not calling out the community so much there, but either way, there's all these like, built-in audiences happening behind the scenes that want to keep discussing mm -hmm. whatever it is. And that's why you see spin-off podcasts around, you know, different popular TV shows and Absolutely. sports teams and things. Yeah. Now, so I guess, uh, you know, in terms of Flick, where do you, what, what's the, um, I'm just trying to think like, what are the, some of the next steps in terms of where you're at in the company? What are some focuses and things that maybe we can uh, yeah. share here in a startup? Yeah, so big focus is on sports. Um, that's a category that, like, not, not on like Hub Dub. Um, we started sort of more horizontally. Like, we supported multiple categories, but sports is the one that's taken off. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna like double down on that. Um, we, um, uh, well, our, our big focus there is is twofold. Um, one is we want to help influencers, these people who organize groups. Uh, engage with their audience, um, particularly around live. Uh, that's where we're seeing like so much traction. Mm -hmm. And then two, we want to help them monetize. Um, so at the moment, we work with a lot of uh, creatives, a lot of um, you know 
you know, organizers who might have a couple of hundred thousand followers on Instagram, but they don't really make that much money from it. <laughs> right. And so uh, we are sort of borrowing from uh, from some of the platforms like in the Far East or like Twitch, like donation and tipping models. Um, and we're extending that to these groups. And so over the next few weeks, actually, we're releasing uh, those functionality that if, you know, if I'm an influencer on uh, Instagram, I can create my community on Flick and I can monetize it there as well. Mm, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's that's a, such a common thing now with all the influencer culture and people, you know, even I think they're what there's kids now saying they want to become an influencer, a YouTuber or yeah. <laughs> as like a profession. It's like, well, most of them don't make money. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I actually had an argument with my, my kids about it. And I was like, I think it was a survey that said in China, like kids, you know, yeah. top thing you want to become is an astronaut. And in America, it was a YouTuber. And I yeah. was like horrified. And they, my <laughs> kids were like, they were like, but YouTubers make loads of money and do something that's really fun. Like, why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> and I was like, I can't argue with your logic. <laughs> <laughs> it's good logic. It's yeah. good logic. Yeah, I get it, right? Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, we've surveyed what uh, we have, we have a pretty good amount of sur uh, uh, podcasters that follow us mm -hmm. mainly in the business kind of space, but we surveyed a hundred or a thousand of them kind of recently here and 85% said they make $0 from their efforts podcast, yeah. which yeah. Lab labor of love, um, and yeah. it's, you know, and part of the problem is there just isn't really good tools for them to monetize, you know, so there's no. For example, an Apple podcast, there's no way to tip, right? right? Um, there's no way to um, become a sub subscriber to the show uh, in, in a way where, you know, you're given some sort of contribution. And so, like, we're, we are excited that there's a, a, like, a more broader movement towards more paid content where, like, people sort of, like, you, you kind of see where you end up where everything's free. You kind of end up with... Mm -hmm. Know, listicles on, on BuzzFeed and I think after a while people realize that like you know what my time's probably more valuable than that I actually would be willing to pay a bit um, you know and so I we see the rise of say the athletic you know there's no shortage of sports content on the web but if I want really good sports content for my team then mm. paying five dollars a month the athletic is a pretty good deal mm. um yeah so you know a sub stack is another one which is doing paid newsletter subscriptions um uh again i think this is a general trend where you know people are like you know what it's when you when you pay nothing you kind of get you know sometimes you get that um it makes sense to like you know support the creators um and and you get a return on on, an, on you know on that investment yeah so would you, that's interesting. You're noticing that trend because this is where, you know, there is a push for content to be free online. I mean, mm -hmm. but there's, again, then there's so much content. So there's a lot of noise. So there's like this kind of balance. And yeah, it's interesting that that's happening. It's like a micro uh, continuity model mm -hmm. that, that people can access. It sounds like more of a distilled version or a very focused version of content. Yeah. 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 So I don't like, I'm not sure. I know that um, the, the whole kind of content wants to be free argument. Like, content wants to be free and that consumers would love everything to be free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, right. I, I'm a consumer. Like, if it's free, great. I love that price <laughs> point. Um, but, you know, like everything else, if something is valuable, you'll be willing to pay for it. And mm -hmm. I think whenever you start to put a price, whenever you put a price on something, it creates a really new interesting dynamic, which is as a creator, um, you then have a customer and you then have to be thinking about how do I build something for that customer? Mm. Um, and that I think, and then you can create something which, you know, like this, so it creates something of value that, you know, someone's willing to pay for it. And then you as a creator have to be figured out what, what that thing is that they'd be willing to pay for. Yeah. And that is a good point. It's there. There is something that people are going to pay for. It's identifying yeah. what that thing is. And yeah, right. and it may be. And you know, there is a great model where the uh, the base thing that you do is free, uh, and maybe it's only five percent of the people want to go to the premium, which adds extra content, feature functionality, and that works. That's a really good model uh, for a lot of businesses. Um, and that's, you know, what we're working with, with Fleck 
is uh, these hosts were the vast majority of what they'll do will be free, mm -hmm. but what they will do is they'll give people the opportunity to go premium and say, hey, you know, I want to support this person, and also I'm going to get something back for it. Um, and so that's that's kind of our model. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it was. Uh, it's it just resonates with what we do as our business model. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. what I was kind of hand signaling uh, to you, Matt. Yeah, he was miming <laughs> to me. I'm like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like we we actively said we want to build our platform. So our the bulk of our content is free. So the podcast yeah. is the biggest part of it. We bring on people like you to share some of your best you know tips, tricks, and stories and stuff. But we actually take notes on every episode. And, yeah. and that becomes, there's a continuity model where we package them up and it's a time saving. So if mm -hmm. someone doesn't want to sit around for an hour twice a week, then they can get these for 15 bucks a month. Yeah. And yeah. there's added stuff too, but it's similar to yeah. what you have just, you know. And that, you know, and that model works like, um, you know, I think Twitch is a really good example. Uh, the vast majority of people who watch Twitch uh, don't pay anything. They'll mm -hmm. watch advertising. Um, but... I think uh, somewhere in the region of 70% of their revenue comes from subscriptions. If I'm a streamer, subscriptions and tipping. Mm. Um, and that comes from a small number, maybe less than, certainly less than 5% of their audience, but it actually makes over 70% of their revenue. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, I want to, I want to talk a bit, a little bit about like actually uh, the, the community building element. So, Let's mm -hmm. say our, our podcast is in Flick and we wanted mm -hmm. to try to grow our community and get discussions going in that community. Yeah. What are some of the ways you've seen other people using the app actually cultivate that? Yeah, so uh, generally what we've seen is that people, you know, they create their Flick group and then they market it to their audience, um, particularly if they can market it around a particular event or topic. Um, so uh, for sports, where they market it typically is around a particular game. Um, for other ones, it's, it tends to be like a particular question. So like a podcast or saying, hey, we're exploring this. Mm -hmm. Or you know, another one might be, we have this uh, guest on our show next week. We'd love to get your feedback on what we should ask that person. Um, that tends to work quite well. Mm. So it's posing questions and in yeah getting yeah. the engagement but, you know just like creating that conversation mm -hmm. yeah no, i like that and that's so uh, it's just a you know we're big fans of building the platform building these new communities where you can inter interchange ideas and you know follow up with folks and yeah that's that's kind of always been our model is like here's how can we cultivate build and cultivate groups that are relevant to what we're talking about because there's always mm -hmm. something more that can come from that and it, mm -hmm. yeah and yeah we haven't have yet to use flick yet but i think it would be a really good value add to mm -hmm. yeah. our podcast and many others out there and it seems simple to manage as well yeah yeah absolutely yeah so what um i, I know a lot of your time you, you said you, you're passionate about entrepreneurship helping people you know kind of navigate the craziness of that <laughs> where mm -hmm. do you like to i mean you have such a i guess what focus or what what do you like to educate folks on that based off of your experience i'm just kind of curious of some of your favorite ways to mm -hmm. to help entrepreneurs out yeah like it you know i uh i was telling some of this the other day like i i do get reached out by a lot of uh, entrepreneurs like even just on linkedin and uh I think my funnel is I typically respond to anybody who's not clearly crazy, <laughs> <laughs> like a little bit crazy. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I very typically ask people to just like email me their questions because um, a lot of time I get people that, you know, they kind of want to talk to me, but they don't really have any questions. Yeah. Which I always find really weird. I'm like, what? wasting you time. Know, <laughs> you know, like, I want to meet, I want to have coffee. And I'm like, great. I don't, you know, coffee is kind of like that will take many weeks to set up. And why don't you just tell me what you want to know? And then, and then it's funny because I, I'd say about half of those, then they never email me again. And I'm like, okay, like, I don't really know why you want to meet me if you really don't have anything to ask me. Um, and then the other thing that I've discovered is the, and, and some of the ones in the do follow up is, they don't actually really want an answer. Um, what they really want is they want validation, right? Mm -hmm. So 
what they really want me to do is me to tell them that their idea is a really great idea. Um, and, and and when I have those conversations, I um, uh, like I often like say to them, say like it's a, I'm, so, I'm, I'm usually pretty honest. Like if, if I think mm -hmm. something is in my category, and if it's in my category, it's in like gaming, and I kind of know it. I'll usually be pretty honest, and I'll say like I I've seen this idea a ton of times before. It's never worked before. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a lot of issues. I uh, personally wouldn't do it, but you know I could well be wrong. Um, uh, but I, the other thing I tell them is like, to be honest, my idea doesn't really matter. It's, you know, and even if I told you, I think this is a great idea, what really matters is customers. Um, mm -hmm. And so like getting me um, to say this is a great idea, it doesn't really like, it doesn't really add much. Right. Um, but it, it, it is weird getting, you know, that contact from someone who doesn't really have a question. They just want me to validate what they're doing. And, and I'm like, that just doesn't. That that's dumb. Yeah, um, no, it's true. That's very. I, I can't validate your idea. I'm not buy unless I'm a customer. Uh, then I'm not validating it. I'm just like giving you my opinion. Yeah, yeah, we get this very very similar things. And mm -hmm. usually, I mean, let's be honest. I feel like a lot of a lot of folks when starting out, you know, and I think that might be the case because you know you have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. We do in our own field and. It's just that little little nudge. Like, oh, yeah, okay, like okay. I, you know, I think everyone wants a little bit of a boost, and you know, if they connect sure. with somebody, you know, who's maybe had the experience, and they say it's great, it's obviously a huge boost. Sure. Um, and uh, and and I just sort of like, look, that's this, this is not that's not where I'm going to be helpful. Yeah. And I also advise them like, don't like the thing about pitching VCs is. Primarily, uh, VCs are there for the money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't be going to these guys if they didn't have money. Mostly right. guys, guys and girls. Um, and and so don't um, don't be going to them for validation, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, and there's often people who are much bigger experts in that in that industry who you can talk to. But also, even then, it's the customers are going to provide validation, and so. Don't be done beating if a VC doesn't like your idea, and also don't like get over too excited when they love it hmm. because you know they don't they don't have a very good hit rate either, right? Yeah. Like hmm. you know they they have you know a two out of ten, then that's great. Think like, of those two really take off, um, and and you know whereas customers have like a hundred percent success rate, right? You know hmm. I've I've yet to find there's very few startups that customers love the product and you know they're really they're buying and that company is not successful and True. so that, that's always been my advice is like if you're looking for validation like you're gonna have to talk to customers yeah yeah what, what's your advice for somebody who's interested in raising some venture capital or um or, or you know raising capital in general what what's your advice for actually approaching people and and sort of getting them to even take your calls or, or get in a room with them yeah it's um so you know, once you know, whenever like if I work with somebody and I'm like, yeah, you know, you're raising venture capital is right for you and for this business and this opportunity, and that's the first hurdle. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies, I, like I sit on a board of a company called Uni, which make mm -hmm. an amazing outdoor pizza oven. Mm -hmm. uh, it can heat to 700 degrees Fahrenheit in about 30 minutes. Cooks pizza in a minute. That Here's sounds, my pick. That sounds um, awesome. <laughs> incredible. It's only 300 dollars, right? Amazing <laughs> company. Um, they uh, they've never raised venture capital. They the founders still own like you know the vast majority of the business. They didn't need to raise venture capital. They they did Kickstarter um, and they built a great product and they had customers buy it. Um, and so that's the first thing I say. Like, is venture capital right for you? Um, uh, and if it is, then generally I say you really have to be in a position where you can clear your diary for anywhere from like sort of three to six months. Um, mm -hmm. It is going to be a long process, uh, typically, um, much longer than anyone really expects because they kind of know some guy who did it in like three weeks or mm -hmm. you know, they read these amazing stories that, you know, the Google founders turn up at somebody's house and he writes them a half million dollar check. In in that night. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's not the norm. Um, <laughs> so I always sort of say, look, expect it's going to be a lot longer. Expect it's, you're going to have to meet a lot more people than than you think, um, and and just get you know like 
you know, you're going to have to spend your time really working your networks to get those introductions and, and go pretty broad. Like um, another mistake a lot of people make is like they go, okay, I'm going to talk to these three investors because I've read their blog posts. I'm sure they'll love it. Mm. And I'm like, you're almost certainly going to come back with three turn downs and you're going to be like really upset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and because you don't know, like you go into that meeting and they might love it, but they've just invested in something that looks kind of vaguely similar or they've made their two investments that year and they're now making a third or, and you, you know, there's 20 reasons that are nothing to do with you or your idea. And so it just, it just doesn't make sense to try and like sort of pre calibrate before um, you really have to go and have that meeting uh, and then just, you know, and then like sort of take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Is there is there a point when a business owner that you found is like the perfect point? That's because you've said you know numerous times now, a great product is the at at most the for the best thing you should do. And then of course understanding your customer mm -hmm. as well. Like, is there a turning point where you found pretty common that like VC monies are a good option to go mm -hmm. now? Sort of depends on the market. Um, like. You know, if you can, if you're, if you're in a market where you can build a business profitably without venture capital, like you should seriously consider doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a market where, like, so for example, with Fleck, uh, Fleck is a product that will go has gone about two years without revenue. Um, we have to really invest in building an extremely robust, um, you know, chat platform. Mm -hmm. um, we can't really do that. We can't really do that you know, without raising venture capital, it's also a very competitive space. Um, and so that's the sort of what made sense for us. Um, like, you know, you raise, you know, you're always, when you're raising money, there's always like two competing forces here. Investors always want to see more traction. Um, and you need money to invest to get that traction. And so, mm. um, you know, typically, uh, you know, you're just sort of fighting that sort of like, well, I, I want to push it out as far as possible, but so I can have more traction, but I also kind of need the resources to get that traction. And so there's no, <laughs> yeah. there's no magic point. Um, it's like a uh, catch 22 a little bit sometimes. It is a total, yeah. Like it is. And you're like, that's why you really are selling starting at early stages is like pre product. You are selling a vision that, you know, you're selling the team, the vision that you can do this and you can build something and then you have to convince people to have belief in you and what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then get ready for the marathon ahead to, of <laughs> yeah, meetings absolutely, and calls. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's a good perspective. Thanks for sharing that. And um, let's let's uh, let's close things off here because we're uh, getting a little, a little longer. Uh, we mm -hmm. always like to ask, what are like what are one or two books that you just find yourself maybe going back to often yourself or gifting to friends or recommending? Mm -hmm. um, like in startup world, I think there's probably three or four that I'd say are kind of must reads uh, mm -hmm. that I would are, are certainly, you know, any founder really benefits from reading them. Um, I would say Peter Thiel, uh, Zero to One, mm -hmm. it's extremely mm -hmm. good. Just that kind of like how to start and um, you know what that actually means. Um, I would say that um, uh, Scott uh, Cooper's book about raising venture capital is extremely good. Um, mm -hmm. I would, you know, if you're raising venture capital, I would definitely read his. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Ries uh, on Lean Startup, uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's kind of a manual. Um, you really need to be reading it. And then the mo one of the ones once you are kind of a starting to be a company, um, but you should read it early is um, is uh, Ben Horowitz. Um, in fact, did both Ben Horowitz's book, uh, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and uh, the more re recent one about culture. Um, both both exceptionally important. Um, they're more sort of softer uh, part of entrepreneurship. And so they're, they're less much of a manual and they really are one that you should go back and read again. Um, hmm. But they're, they're very, very important. And like how you think about building your company and what's your culture you want to have and 
dealing with the sort of challenges of of being a sort of a founder, founder and CEO. Founder, yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. Those are perfect recommendations. I think it covers everything we pretty much <laughs> talked about on this call too. That's yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. For awesome. sure. Now, yeah. so uh, flickapp.com, everybody listening should go check out that app. Is there anybody else, or not anybody else, anywhere else you'd want to send somebody after listening to this episode? Sure, yeah, like I'm on Twitter, uh, Nigel Eccles. Uh, in fact, I just uh, shared today uh, a, a guide to employee uh, options, uh, which is mm. like... Seems like a very mundane topic. Um, it is very complex and confusing. And uh, what I always find is that if something is complex, confusing, it doesn't actually represent a very good incentive to someone. And so uh, I put together a post that really tried to explain very simply how options work and you know uh, yeah. for employees. Uh, so that that's a you know that's something I just uh, shared on Twitter today, but. Nice. That's the sort of things I, I like to do uh, on Twitter when I get the chance. When you get the chance, yeah. <laughs> <When you laughs> like it's all. That's Very cool. Good. Yeah, I'll go and follow you because I think it's fascinating stuff, and especially from your perspective too. Yeah, and we'll link uh, we'll link that stuff up in the show notes so people can easily really? go and find you as well. Cool, Nigel. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time, man. It's been a great time. Thanks. It's been fantastic. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning into that episode. I hope you dug it. I know Joe and I dug it. I actually kicked Joe out of the room. He's not here right now because I wanted to tell you about a tool that I really, really dig. We use it in our business. We recommend it all the time. It's called Easy Webinar, and it's a tool that lets you do live webinars, automated webinars, hybrid webinars, and, uh, you know, pretty much any other kind of webinar if there are other kinds of webinars. But anyway, this tool is kind of like your all-in-one do-it-all tool for anything webinar related. It's Easy Webinar. It's put out by a dude named Casey Zeman. He's been on the podcast. If you haven't listened to that episode, it's a killer episode. He's a really smart dude, but his software is amazing. It does everything. It's, you know, the title tells you exactly what it does. It's an easy webinar platform. And we use this in our business to run automated webinars all the time. We don't do a lot of live webinars these days. We like to do the kind of automated webinars where somebody can register and then it, you know, they can either watch it like 15 minutes later or they can watch it the next day, but it's just kind of always running. And it's a system that helps us make autopilot sales off of our webinars. Super cool tool. If you haven't tried it yet, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing tool. And, uh, Casey is actually hooking you up. He said for listeners of Hustle and Flowchart, I can't believe he's doing this, but he said for, for listeners of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast, he's giving 25% off of the membership to use Easy Webinar. It's already super, super inexpensive for what it does and all the cool features it has, but he's hooking you up with 25% off because you're a listener of Hustle and Flowchart. Go to easywebinar.com slash hustle. That's where you can get that 25% off discount. That's easywebinar.com slash hustle. It's an awesome tool. You're going to dig it. So just go grab it. Check it out. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. See ya. No, not see ya. You'll hear me in the next show. I don't know. I don't know how to close these things. Go get Easy Webinar. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out all the good stuff from this episode we actually have a nice simple notes version that you can find on our website so go to evergreenprofits.com find this episode that you just listened to and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes thanks for listening mm -mm.